some tales and experiments. The first story I have for you is Jamie O'Rourke and the Big Potato. Jamie O'Rourke was the laziest man in all of Ireland. He would do anything to avoid working, especially if it had to do with growing potatoes. Jamie O'Rourke, his wife Eileen would say, will have nothing to eat this winter if you don't go out and dig up all the praties. Oh, saints preserve us, Jamie would whine. May backs as sore as can be, sure as I'm telling you, wife. You'll have to dig them up yourself, and I'll break in two if I so much as get up out of this bed. So Eileen, who had done all the planting and watering and weeding anyhow, would go out into the tiny garden and dig up the smallest potatoes in Ireland, all because Jamie was too lazy to dig a larger garden and had no money to buy good potato seed. Then poor Eileen wrenched her back and was laid up in bed. Saint Bridget and Virgin Mary herself must have smiled down on Eileen O'Rourke, the villagers had said. Why, this is the first rest she's had since she's married Jamie O'Rourke. With Eileen in bed, Jamie began to worry. No Eileen to dig meant no praties all winter, and no praties meant no food. Oh, poor me, wailed Jamie. I'll starve to death. I best go to church and confess to Father O'Malley. There's no telling how soon old death will be knocking at me door. Soon enough, though, it was midnight. Jamie set out for the church. He was about halfway down the hill when he heard singing and the tap, tap, tapping sound. Sure, and I wouldn't be known, Jamie whispered, but I swear it's a leprechaun. And sure enough, sitting and sing, sitting in a circle of ferns in the moonlight was a leprechaun singing and hammering tiny nails into the heels of fairy boots he was making. Jamie knew just what to do. He crept up and grabbed the little man by his coattails and held firm. Let me go, let me go, the leprechaun shouted. Not on your life, said Jamie. Not until you show me where you keep your pot of gold. Now everyone in Ireland knows that leprechauns make boots and dancing shoes for fairies who pay for them with gold. And everyone knows that if you catch a leprechaun, he'll pay for his freedom with his pot of gold. But this leprechaun was cleverer than most. Oh, please, Mr. Mortal Man, he pleaded. I'm just starting out making fairy shoes and I only have one or two pieces of gold in my pot. Won't you take a wish instead? Why that, why, what would I wish for, Jamie asked. Me who's about to die of starvation because my wife is sick in bed and can't dig up the praties for winter. And they're such a puny praties anyhow. Well, said the leprechaun, reaching into his pocket, you could wish for the biggest praty in the world. It would last all winter, and you wouldn't have to do anything more than plant this seed, water it, and wait. That sounded wonderful to Jamie. Done, he shouted. And as the leprechaun dropped the seed into Jamie's hand, Jamie let go of his coattails and off the leprechaun scampered. When Eileen heard of what he had done, she was furious. Jamie O'Rourke, you're not only the laziest man in Ireland, but a fool as well, giving up a pot of gold for a pretty seed. Well, I'm going to plant this seed and water it and you'll see, Jamie said, and out he went. And Faith, Eileen did see. In no time at all, the biggest, finest potato plant had sprouted out of the ground, followed by the potato itself. It was so big that it pushed up not only all the dirt in the garden, but the garden shed and the corner of the cottage as well. Well, surely now it's ready to dig, Jamie said proudly. 
He hoed all around, but he couldn't dig that pretty out of the ground. He got a beam and a big rock and tried to pry it out. He pushed and he pushed, but it wouldn't budge. As he was pondering what to do, his neighbor passed by on his way to the village. He couldn't believe his eyes. He couldn't wait to tell everyone in the village what he had seen. And before they knew it, the hill up to Jamie's was filled with villagers coming to see the big potato. Where did that come from, they asked. Jamie told them about the lucky night when he had caught the leprechaun and how smart he had been. Why, anyone could have gotten a pot of gold, he bragged. But the biggest pretty in the world, well, that took some doing. However did you outsmart the leprechaun, they all asked at once. Jamie hesitated and scratched his head. We'll help you dig out your pretty, Jamie, if you'll tell us what you did. And they grabbed their shovels and their hoes and started to dig. They dug and they dug and they pushed and they shoved until the potato flew out of its hole and it rolled down the hill faster and faster until it reached the bottom where it bounced up high and came atop, came to a stop and wedged between the stone walls on either side of the road. What to do now? Look at the potato stuck in the road. That crazy so big that no, no one, no cart, nothing can get by it, the constable complained to Father O'Malley. How's a body to get out, in or out of the village? What shall we do, the villagers wailed. Then they all looked at Jamie and said, it's your crazy, you'll have to move it out of our way. Well, Eileen spoke up, there's more than enough crazy for everyone, why don't you all take some? So the villagers sawed and chopped and carted off huge pieces of potato while Jamie sat on the stone wall and watched. Look at him cutting up the potato. All winter long, everyone had potato to eat and eat and eat until no one wanted to see or hear a potato again. Could you imagine eating potatoes all winter? In the spring, Jamie said, I've saved a potato eye for a seed, and it's, a, and it's just about time to plant it. Oh no, the villagers cried. If you promise not to plant it, Jamie, we'll promise before St. Patrick and all the saints that, to see that you and Eileen always have plenty to cook and eat. We don't want another giant pretty around here. Jamie smiled and agreed. What a perfect life for a lazy man. And you see, darling Eileen, Jamie told her, I wasn't such a fool with that leprechaun after all. And, ja and Eileen had to admit that Jamie O'Rourke was right. The End So everyone, this is our potato experiment. And in your kit, you should have everything except the butter knife that you need. Make sure you ask a grown-up um, to use a butter knife um, before you start this experiment and let them know what you're doing. So in your kit, you should have four pennies, four of these little washers, two lights, and five of these wires, and two potatoes, because you'll need those. And we're gonna make a little electricity um, using these two potatoes. So the first thing you want to do is take your butter knife and cut your potatoes in half, like so. So I'm going to cut both of them just like that. It may be a little hard because the potatoes are raw, but there you go. And I'm going to set them up like this, like four in a row. Then you're going to take one penny and one washer and stick one of each in each potato. Just push it in, it should go in pretty well. You can see right there how I have that one pushed in. You want it sticking out just enough. Do the same with your washer, just like that. So we have those 
and I'm going to stick one in this one, and then the washer in this one, and a penny in there, and then a washer in there. You might want to do this all on top of a paper towel like I'm doing because the um, potatoes are going to leak a little bit of their um, juice out on whatever surface you're working on. So, once you have all of those, you want to put a washer facing a penny. Kind of like I have it here. So I have a, wa a penny and a washer, penny and a washer, penny and a washer, just like that. Then the next thing you're going to need is your five wires. And it doesn't matter which color you use for um, connecting each part. So you're going to take one of your wires and connect one of the clips to a washer and then connect another one of the clips to a penny, like so. And then you're going to take, do the same thing. And when you get done, you should have two loose ends that you can plug into your um, light bulb. So I'm going to do like that and like that. And there's a little diagram in your um, packet that will show you how to do this if you have any questions or need to look closer. Um, then once you have it all like that where they're connected in a circuit. So we're trying to make a circuit here. And then we'll take the last one and we have it connected to a washer on this side. Sorry if I can get the clip out here. And like that. Oop, came off. Right. And then we'll connect it to the penny on this side. Then you have your two little light bulbs right there and then you can take the light the ends of the, the metal ends of the light bulb and i would just bend them out a little bit shouldn't be too hard to do and then you take the one loose end and stick it to one side of the light bulb and then you take the other end and stick it to this side of the light bulb and hopefully your it's really hard to see, but your light bulb can light up. So you can try doing both bulbs at one time, um, but it will be a little lighter when that happens. And you've just created electricity with two potatoes. So I hope you enjoyed this experiment of using potatoes to make electricity. And now I have a Chuck Ta tale of how thunder and lightning came to be. In the time of long ago, the great Sun Father wanted to give his chosen people, the Chuck Ta, a warning to seek shelter before he sent the wind and rain down to earth. He thought for many days, but he could not decide what the best warning would be. And since he was busy with other things, he thought it would be thought he would get someone else to work on the problem. He called on two great silly birds who had nothing else to do. I will give you a home on top of the clouds, he said, if you will think of a good way to warn my chosen people of any coming storm. Haloa and Malatha were proud and happy to be called upon to help the great Sun Father. Haloa was a big and slow-moving bird, while her mate, Malatha, was a much smaller and very, very fast bird. He was also very clumsy. Once the two birds were settled in their new home, they began to think about ways to warn the people. This was not going to be easy because they were not the smartest of birds. Malatha, my husband, I have an idea, Haloa said. 
Could you stick your head down between the clouds and shout to everyone loudly that a storm is coming? Moatha thought about this for a while, then nodded his head. That's a good idea, my dear. Let us see if it will work. So Malatha stuck his head into the clouds, and, but he could not see anything. He leaned over a little further, but still he could not see anything. So he leaned over a little further. His feet flew out from under him, and he fell out of the clouds and went tumbling to the earth. Malatha landed right in the middle of a Choctaw cornfield, and a big dust cloud rose all around him. He jumped up and began to try and brush the dirt off his feathers. The children of the village were picking ripe corn when Malatha fell out of the sky. They stared at the huge dusty bird and did not know whether to laugh or to run away. Feeling very silly, Malatha began to flap his wings to get the dust off. As he flapped those big wings, the, the dust cloud grew bigger and bigger, and then he started to sneeze. Achoo! 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 As he rose into the air, he continued to sneeze. Achoo! Achoo! And the children laughed and shouted as Malatha and the dust cloud went higher and higher into the sky until the sound of sneezing finally faded away. When he was home again, Haloa fussed over him and gave him cold water to drink. I'm sorry, my husband, for giving you such a bad idea, she said. No, no, my love, Haloa said. It's, it was a good idea, but I am too clumsy. Come, let us think of something else, Malatha said. The next day, Malatha had a new idea. I will go down to earth and run from village to vi village, calling out a warning as I pass. I will have to run my fastest to get to everyone in time, but I'm sure this plan will work. What do you think, Heloa? I think this is a fine idea, my dear, and well worth a try, Heloa answered. The Choctaw villages were scattered across many miles of hills, swamps, and forests, and Malatha called upon all of his great speed to reach each one. A storm is coming, a storm is coming, he shouted, but he was moving so fast that his words were lost in the wind. The people watched with silent as amazement as Malatha flush, flashed by and disappeared in a swirl of dust and autumn leaves. On he raced, moving faster and faster than any whirlwind around the swamps and through the forests he sped, thinking only of the need to hurry, when suddenly, splash, he fell right into a stream that ran laughing and singing along the forest floor. The cold water soaked his feathers and chilled his feet before he could climb onto the dry earth again. Dripping and shivering, he made his way home to Haloa. You did the best you could, my love, she said, and that is all anyone can do. We will work on this another time. But the next day, it was time for Haloa to lay her eggs. The clouds in her new home were so soft and fluffy, she decided to lay her eggs instead of building a nest. As soon as Haloa laid the giant egg, they began to roll. Malatha, my husband, could you come and catch the eggs, please? She called out loudly for Malatha, was fond of roaming far from home. Malatha was indeed far from home, but he heard his wife call him. I'm coming, dear, I'll be right there, he shouted back. He called on every bit of his great speed and ran flashing across the sky with sparks flying from his heels. <clears throat> he ran so fast that his feet got tangled up and he fell out of the clouds and hit a tree on the earth. The sparks flew crackling and popping and the tree split in half 
but the Chuck Tower people hardly noticed because they were having a noisy celebration. It was the time of the green corn dance. And when the people gave thanks to the great Sun Father for their good harvest, a big drum played by two drummers sat in the center of the village and around it the people were singing and dancing. The children were playing chase with the dogs, wrestling with one another and dancing their own little dances. When Malatha hit the tree, he sat back on his tail feathers and felt a little dizzy, but he jumped up and flew back into the clouds. This time, some of the children looked up and they remembered him. They laughed and clapped as, the, as he streaked across the sky, but Malatha was moving too fast to notice. He could hear the eggs bumping and rumbling together and gathering speed as they rolled away, filling the sky with sounds that were louder than the big drum. Hurry! He must hurry to catch the eggs. But he was too late. The eggs rolled faster and faster across the endless clouds until they were lost. Malatha went to tell his wife the bad news. I didn't catch the eggs because I'm a cl I am clumsy and foolish, he said sadly. Malatha, my love, don't worry. We will have plenty of time and there will be other eggs. You are safe and we are together, so all is well. Aloha smiled and Malatha was happy again. The great sun father was watching all of this and he was very pleased with the two birds for sending such a bright, noisy warning to the Choctaw people. From this time, from that time to this, whenever Haloa lays her eggs and Malatha chases them, the great sun father calls the wind and sends the rain falling to the earth. Haloa continues to lay her eggs on the clouds. She does not worry, for she knows that one day her swift Malatha will catch enough to make a little family. In time, Malatha's name came to mean lightning and Haloa's, thun and Haloa's thunder, and they are still trying to think of a good warning to send the Choctaw people when a storm is coming. The end. Hello everybody, and this is our experiment where we're going to make a little bit of our own thunder by doing an experiment where we're gonna pop a balloon with an orange peel. Um, this was pretty cool and I didn't think it would work the first time I tried. So you have three balloons in your packet, so you can try this up to three times. So the first thing you want to do is blow up your balloon. Now for this experiment to work, you have to make sure your balloon is blown up pretty tightly. So make sure that you um, get the balloon nice and tight. That's pretty big. <laughs> so. so once you have your balloon all blown up like so, you're going to tie it off down here and have that sitting there maybe hopefully it won't roll off the table if it does I'll go and get it then you want to take your orange and um, pull off some of the peel so we're going to do that right here I'm just gonna peel some of it off right here now you want the outside of the orange peel facing outward when you do this. It won't work with the inside. So um, the, uh, the, some of the acid on the skin is actually what makes the balloon pop. So hopefully this will... And there you go. 
So feel free to try it again with your other two balloons and you can enjoy eating your orange as well. You're supposed to be able to also do this experiment um, with limes. So give that a try if you want to buy some limes at the market and enjoy your orange. Should be delicious. And now we have an African tale of the story of, thun of lightning and thunder by Ashley Bryan. A long time ago, I mean a long, long time ago, if you wanted to pack lightning or chat with thunder, you could do it. Uh-huh, you could. Thunder was a mother sheep and lightning was her son, a ram. In those days, thunder and lightning did not live in the sky. Uh-huh, they lived right here on Earth. Their home was in a village on the west coast of Alkibulan. Uh-huh, Alkibulan, called Africa today. Ma Sheep Thunder and her son lived in a hut where he was born, just east of the marketplace. You'd see them standing by the door of their hut. You could stop for a chat or to pat or just wave as you walked by. They watched the flow, the come and the go of the people from the country and the people from the town. When they tired of looking one way, they could always turn around. Use your head, son, Ma Sheep Thunder said. If things don't work out one way, try another. Hear what I say. I'm your mother. I hear you. I hear you, Sun Ram Lightning would say. And he did in his own way. Ma Sheep Thunder was a good friend of Ray. If the farmer's field needed moisture, Ma Sheep Thunder would go high up onto the, to a nearby mountain to call rain. But often she had to call a long time before rain would come. After her son was born, Ma Sheep Thunder taught him to help her call for rain. Then her rumbling voice and flash of her son's fleece as he raced in the mountain caught rain's attention at once and rain came quickly. One season, the farmlands were dry. The king sent for Ma Sheep Thunder and Sun Ram Lightning. He knew that they were rain's best friends. They could call rain down. It took the two of them, he knew it, and he was proud that they could do it, he said. Crops are thirsty, land is dry, call friend rain, down from the sky. Off they went. They, when they were high up in the mountains, Sun Ram Lightning bolted ahead of his mother. He zigzagged across the slopes, sparks flying from his coat. Ma Sheep Thunder followed, calling, Bob Lamb, Bob Lamb. Suddenly, rain clouds appeared along the path of the mountaintop. When Sun Ram Lightning saw friend Rain in the clouds, he flashed a greeting. Ma Sheep Thunder clapped, but wham, a friend rain stepped out of the clouds and fell. The villagers cheered, their crops were saved. They sang and danced in the rain. It was no wonder that Ma Sheep Thunder and Sun Ram Lightning were the two most honored inhabitants in the kingdom. Children like to pat Sun Ram Lightning's coat and watch the sparks fly. Ma Sheep Thunder stood by chatting while Sun Ram Lightning stood still for the patting. However, he much preferred racing in the mountains, sparks flying, his mother following. One year, Ma Sheep Thunder and Sun Ram Lightning came often at the king's call for rain. The crops were splendid and there was a great harvest celebration. The king entered the village in a procession led by the drummers. People crowded around him. Stand right by me, Ma Sheep Thunder said to her son. Your horns may have grown, but you're not grown up yet. Sun Ram Lightning wanted to show off his horns to the king. He and his mother were far back in the crowd. While his mother chatted, he hopped and jumped, but the crowd blocked his view.
If things don't work out one way, try another, he said, remembering his mother's words. Use your head. He lowered his head and pawed the ground, param, 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 and charged with a biff, bam, but he sent people flying or falling to both sides. It got him to the head of the crowd. Uh-huh, it did. He stopped before the, before the king. What a hard head, cried the king. What horns, and they're not all grown out yet said Sun Ram Lightning. You boast, said the king. It's an outrage at your age to go on such a rampage. I use my head as I heard Ma say, with a biff, bam, but I cleared the way. There is a better way, son, to use your head, Ma Sheep Thunder, said Ma Sheep Thunder. Whatever you do, no more biff, bam, buts out of you. There is a proverb, the king said, a frisky child knocks his face against a rock. Uh-huh. Bad ways will get you into trouble. My people are no rock, and your son to, for your son to knock. To protect them, I must move you from the center of the village to the edge of town. After they moved, Ma Sheep Thunder kept a close watch on Sun Ram Lightning, especially when they went to market. For a good while, she kept him out of trouble. But one very hot day, they set out for the village market. It was a long walk, and when they arrived in the marketplace, Sun Ram Lightning was hungry. We'll eat soon, his mother said. She stopped to chat with a friend who made straw baskets and straw hats. As she chatted, she soon forgot about food, and she soon forgot about her son. Sun Ram Lightning waited. He grew hungrier and hungrier. Leaning over, he licked a basket. Tasty straw, he thought. He tried another, and he licked his way down the line of baskets. Then he st started on the straw hats. His teeth nicked the broom. A tasty hat. Mmm. He took a bite. It stirred his appetite. Um, yum, a delight. He began munching and crunching the straw hat. He was so hungry, he devoured it and started on another. Sun Ram Lightning didn't notice that this hat was at the bottom of the pile. A few bites into it, and a mountain of straw hats came tumbling down around him. Hey, hey, cried the straw maker when she turned and saw what was happening. Sun Ram Lightning was surprised to find himself in a sea of hats. The straw maker raised her broom to strike. Sun Ram Lightning shook free of the hats. He lowered his head and pawed the ground. Param, param, param. Stop, cried Ma, Ma Sheep Thunder. Whether her stop was for the straw maker or for her son, it didn't stop either of them. Sun Ram Lightning came charging. Wham, biff, bam. His head split the broom and spilled the straw maker. She landed crunch on five straw baskets. Ma Sheep Thunder helped the straw maker to her feet. She apologized to her friend and she hurried her son away from the scene. Didn't I tell you no more biff bam butts, she said. That was no biff bam butts, said Sun Ram Lightning. That was a wham biff bam. I saw that broom coming. I couldn't dodge it, so I charged it. I used my head, as you said. There is a better way for you to use your head, son, his mother said. Whatever you do, no more wham, biff, bam out of you. When this incident was reported to the king, he sent for the mother sheep and her son, Ram. You're good for rain, he said, but I'll have to move you once again, even further away than before. We're already at the edge of town, said Ma Sheep Thunder. How much further can we go? I'll move you beyond the village, said the king, past farmlands and fields to the center of the forest. Uh, 
From the center of the village to the center of the forest side, Mashi Thunder, their new home was a long way off. Mashi Thunder missed the chatting, Sun Ram Lightning didn't miss standing still for the paths. He was free now to skip and bound in the forest. His mother didn't have to follow him about all the time. He felt grown up. Uh-huh. He could come and go now all by himself. One morning, Sun Ram Lightning went out to play. Remember now, don't go too far, said his mother. After a few bounces and bounds around the hut, he began to bite berries on the bushes nearby. Before he knew it, he had nibbled his way to the edge of the forest. He looked up and there was an ox eating the vegetables in the field. Sun Ram Lightning knew he was not to leave the forest without his mother. Still, he wanted to save the farmer's crops. Ma says no Biff Bam butts, he thought, and no Wham Biff Bams either. I'll just Biff Bop him. That will stop him and everyone will thank me. Sun Ram Lightning pawed the ground, purum, purum, purum. He lowered his head and charged Biff Bop. He struck Ox from behind. The Ox reared up, moo He spun around and came down facing Sun Ram Lightning. One look at Ox and Ram's charge plan changed. He turned and took off. Sun Ram Lightning ran so swiftly that the sparks showered down from his coat. The sparks caught among the dry leaves. In a short while, flames had consumed more of the farmer's crop than ox could have eaten in a whole day. Ox stopped and backed up before the flames. Sun Ram Lightning entered the forest. He slowed down when he saw the ox no longer followed. By now the villagers had reached the edge of the field. Drummers drummed the fire signal as the villagers cried, Who fires the field? Fires food. Friend of rain should do us good. Ma Sheep Thunder smelled the smoke and heard the commotion. She ran out of her hut and caught up with her son. To the mountain, to the mountain, she cried. Bablam, bablam. She called Friend Rain as her son streaked ahead. Before they reached the top of the mountain, Friend Rain had seen the light flashes and heard the call. Rain came and poured down on the fields until the fires were out. There, were no more, there was no dancing and cheering in the village this time. A solemn group of villagers stood behind the king as Ma Sheep Thunder and Sun Ram Lightning entered the village. I've heard the cry of my people, the king said. They no longer feel safe with you living on earth amongst them. Even when your son tries to help, he hurts. From now on, you are banished from my kingdom and from earth. Your home will be far away from all of us, beyond our call in the sky. Ma Sheep Thunder and Sun Ram Lightning obeyed the wishes of the king and his people. They returned to the mountain. When they reached the mountain top, they kept going. They followed the path that the clouds take when they're coming down from the sky to the mountain. Farther and farther along the path they went. At last, they reached their new home in the sky. That is where they live to this day. Every now and again, Sun Ram Lightning gets away from home. Uh-huh, he does, and he still causes trouble. He streaks back to earth and strikes anything in his path. His mother runs after him, her voice rumbling, calling him back. Sometimes Ma Sheep Thunder is so far behind we can hardly hear her voice. Sun Ram Lightning hears her, though, but he doesn't always listen. Uh-huh. I know somebody like that, too. Mm-hmm. I do, but I'm not saying who.
the end.